Pilate wrote a notice and had it put on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, is what he wrote. The chief priest said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the King of the Jews. What I have written stays written. At first sight, I mean, a lot of people said, well, it's easy, it's all done for you. And of course, it was quite the opposite. And you have everything to do when you have to follow something word for word. Do not be surprised, because I tell you that you must all be born again. You have to, in a sense, reinvent it. The wind blows wherever it wishes. You hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. Every story you tell, you kind of look for a key phrase, a key thought about what it actually is. And while I was researching it, I came across this wonderful phrase. The Gospel of John is strange, restless, mysterious and poetic. And I thought, yeah, that's what this has got to be. You do not believe me when I tell you about the things of this world. How will you ever believe me then? when I tell you about the things of heaven. So once I got that, at least then I had a kind of idea of what the movie is about. I've never seen a film like this. I mean, it has turned out to be something quite unique. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. Wars have been fought over to what extent our Lord was human and to what extent he was divine. And the gospel starts, in the beginning was the word. The word became flesh, so immediately you have a clue. In the opening sequence, you only see Jesus' point of view. He is the camera, if you like, coming into the world. And then you see his shadow, and you don't actually see him himself as a wonderful shot where you see the shadow and you pull out and there he is. He's very much kind of inspired, sort of incandescent. He's, he's extraordinary. So in a sense, John tips further towards the divinity of Christ than other gospels. The word became a human being and full of grace and truth lived among us. Miracles basically happen off camera. Because what's interesting about miracles, um, the definition of a miracle, in Roman Catholic doctrine at least, is an event that creates faith. So what is important about miracles is not the hocus pocus and the conjuring trick. It's the effect it has on other people. It was one o'clock yesterday afternoon when the fever left him. So I felt the way to do it was to look at the wonder in people's faces Get up. The lame man. Pick up your mat and walk. The gospel says he got up and walked. So he gets up and walks. You don't need any special effects, any kind of, you know, the usual things you see in, in sort of horror movies. You don't need any of that. Because as it, as it would have happened, it would have been like that. He just would have got up and walked. Immediately. The man got well. And of course in John, they're called miracles in the version that we have. In our many other versions, they're called signs. They point to things. So the magic is unimportant. It's the symbolism which is important. From a technical writing point of view, well, there was every kind of problem. I mean, let's talk about the big problem which was, is what they call the farewell discourses. When that day comes, you will know that I am in my Father and that you are in me. After the Last Just Supper, I'm in you. our Lord doesn't stop talking for so about five chapters. And they're called the farewell discourses because he's basically saying goodbye. I too will love them and reveal myself to them. You really can't have a man talking for 20 minutes. What do we do? Well, there's a wonderful moment where, where Jesus says, let us leave this place. I thought, oh, thank 
heaven for that. We can get them out of the, the upper room, out of Jerusalem, and move them around. So immediately, you have a valid filmic tool to use. They're on the move. You can get angles, you know, it's night. You can have torchlight stabbing the darkness. You can do all kinds of stuff to keep it visually alive while Jesus talks. But of course, it wasn't enough. And then, at three o'clock one morning, in utter despair, the phrase summing up came to me. And I suddenly realized that you could justifiably flash back to earlier events in the story, which would work for the summing up aspect of it, but it would also serve to bring out the meaning of what he was saying in an absolutely valid way, without making any theological point myself. So that whole passage from being a sort of appalling problem, I think it's become rather wonderful. And I want them to be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, the glory you gave me. For you loved me before the world was made. Righteous Father. Again and again, the Bible says, the Pharisees said, the disciples said. How do you show that? You can't have 12 disciples all simultaneously saying the same thing. I mean, it'd be ridiculous. So you either have to give it to the narrator to say, or you can break it up, which you can then give to individuals. And out of that arose the idea to create a sort of generic Pharisee. And we call him the leading Pharisee. Look at all the miracles this man is performing. If we let him go on in this way, everyone will believe in him. And the Roman authorities will take action and destroy our temple and our nation. It's been called an anti-Semitic document, but it isn't and it cannot be because Jesus himself was a Jew and all his disciples were Jewish. I mean, the idea that Judaism at the time, or even today, was a kind of homogenous whole where everybody agreed on everything is absurd. They didn't. Um, there were Pharisees, there were Sadducees, there were Essenes, there were... Uh, as it is today. I mean, look at, look at the church today. There are Roman Catholics, there are Anglicans, there are Baptists, there are, you know, and we all spend half our time fighting each other, right? No different then. He has a demon! He's crazy! Why do you listen to him? A man with a demon could not talk like this. How could a demon give sight to blind people? Whoa! So from that point of view, it absolutely isn't anything to do with anti-Semitism. It does take a stronger line than other Gospels about the hierarchy. What I think it is, it's anti-clerical. The conflict starts when Jesus first goes up to Jerusalem and says, you've got it all wrong, guys. Moses, in whom you have put your hope, is the very one who will accuse you. If you had really believed Moses, you would have believed me, because he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how can you believe what I say? Immediately, he is up against the establishment. That's what the, that's what the conflict is. It's got nothing to do with racism. Yes, it's really got nothing to do with a conflict of two religions because there was no Christianity at that Judge point. There was only sins. Judaism. And you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I am. Who are you? There's an enormous amount of stage direction because I knew that in a sense, it would be like a silent movie, that although half these disciples weren't named and very few of them have any lines to say, unless they as actors kind of knew what was going on, nobody could have played the scenes. And as it's turned out, they are marvellous. I mean, these are very talented actors. And at once, blood and water poured out. The one who saw this happen has spoken of it so that you may also believe. John, the beloved disciple, who's sort of the narrator of the gospel, he's the one who's told the story and he knows it's true. Uh, he was an eyewitness. And Thomas, of course, doubting Thomas. It's terribly important that there should be one like that, because that's us. It's the world that can't see. I mean, how much proof do you need? Then reach out your hand and put it in my side. <laughs> Stop your doubting and believe. <laughs> my Lord. And my God. Peter, of course, is a kind of stumble bum. Do not wash only my feet then. 
Wash my hands. And head to. He's strong and he's faithful, but he makes mistakes all the time. He's the one who says, I, I die for you with this and the other, and, and Jesus says, you know, I hereby predict you will deny me three times, and guess what he does? Didn't I see you with him in the garden? No. So who does Peter remind one of? He reminds one of oneself. Simon, son of John, do you love me? We all fail, we all misunderstand, we all betray, we all make mistakes. So why on earth did Jesus call him the rock? You know everything. And say that upon this rock he would found his church. You know that I love you. Because unless a church is founded on ordinary people, it has no future. Take care of my sheep. And I loved the gospel. And I felt that because that was the policy, word for word, it would be a worthy enterprise. But it wasn't going to be something which was in any way taking a point of view. It was what it was, the visual Bible. So yes, I mean, that's, that's what excited me about it. He is the disciple who spoke of these things, the one who also wrote them down. And we know that what he said is true. Now, there are many other things that Jesus did. If they were all written down one by one, I suppose that the whole world could not hold the books that would be written.